Hello, everybody. Hi. I have Michelle Patton from Patton Accounting or Patton Bookkeeping. Sorry, I keep saying accounting. Patton, Patton Bookkeeping with us today. And so we are going to talk about um, bookkeeping, have any any questions that you have, let's get those answered. It is by far the biggest subject that I get questions asked on, the, the biggest subject that I talk to people about besides entity structure is keeping track of your books. Because even if you don't have an entity structure, an LLC, a corporation, an S-corp, whatever, even if you're just a sole proprietor, you still need to have bookkeeping done. And so a lot of people are not doing their bookkeeping, they're not doing it correctly, um, whatever. They think that they can't afford a bookkeeper. So today, in, in my opinion, we're going to expel some myths, right, Michelle? <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> and we're going to talk about what, why, what, why, and how you can um, have a bookkeeper. Um, so first of all, let's just thanks Michelle for being a sport and and jumping on and sharing the information. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Can you tell us a little bit about the structure of your bookkeeping because it's just it's mostly farmers, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, so my business is, like you said, it's related to farmers and ranchers. And so what we do is we help farmers, ranchers, and even like agribusiness owners, um, to operate profitable and lasting businesses. And we do that through bookkeeping, training, and financial consulting. Okay. Awesome. Now you farm yourself. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That, um, is, to me, that's important. Yeah. Because you understand the industry, you understand what people, what the bank wants for loans, you understand what the accountant is looking for when he's looking at farm records. Yep. Yeah. So I come from a farm family. Uh, my dad was actually a dairy farmer when I was younger, turned cattle rancher. And then I married um, uh, my husband, his family. He's like a fifth generation cattle ranchers and, and they do uh, wheat farming and things like that. So it's just, uh, it's been part of both of our lives for a very long time. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I know my farmers appreciate it when I can speak the language and I understand the ups and the downs of what they're going through. Yeah. Tell us, what is what are the biggest things that you see people asking you for or biggest things that we can improve on? Um um, yeah, I think for me, the, the biggest thing that I see is, um, not having current bookkeeping. Um, so a lot of times they're trying to get their bookkeeping done in time for taxes. And that's the only reason they're doing it so that they can get their taxes filed and move on with their lives. And, um, I think that any business, whether you're a farm or ranch, whether you're just at, like you said, a, a sole proprietor who files a schedule F on your, you know, tax returns, even that person should be doing their bookkeeping, I think, on a monthly basis. And um, so that's one of the services that I do provide. But um, there's a couple reasons why I think it does help for your books to be current. Um, uh, the biggest reason is it's going to provide you the financial information that you need to make decisions in your business. Um, so you can be running your financial statements, your profit and loss, or your income statement, and your balance sheet to be um, but to see what your, um, what the net worth is of your business and what, how you're spending your money, what your revenue is on a monthly basis. And, um, for farmers and ranchers, that's going to be negative probably most of the year. And then, <laughs> um, around the end of the year, whenever they're selling their crops, you know, they're going to have a lot of income coming in, but it still is important to be running those on a monthly basis. So that you can see where you are spending your money and where you're at financially. Um, and the other reason is it, um, it does save you money in a lot of ways because I think when, um, you're doing your bookkeeping on a regular basis, you are less likely to misclassify transactions. Uh, because, the, you know, the transaction is fresh in your mind. You remember what it is. And, um. Can we, can I stop you right there and can we talk about classifying transactions like what would be the biggest or what do you see as some of the biggest errors as far as misclassifying um 
You know, I think a lot of it is probably just um, trying to pass off personal spending as business spending. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, so, um, but yeah, you know, it's just little things like they might have gone to the gas station, but did they buy gas or did they buy meals? Um, okay. Meals are 50% deductible at the most. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're trying to deduct 100% of your meals by passing it off as gas and then you get audited and one, you don't have a receipt to prove it or you do have the receipt and it's telling you that you spent it on the wrong, the other thing, um, that's going to be an issue. So I think that's what I see a lot because, you know, farmers and ranchers, they're running everywhere, getting carts, stuff at the gas station or whatever. And so I think that's probably the biggest thing that I see. And so... That, let's talk about that for a sec, because I had a question messaged to me about should I, and I mean, I know the answer to this, but should I have a personal credit card and a business credit card and a fuel credit card? Should I have three different credit cards um, just to keep things simple? Um, you know, it's not a terrible idea. And if you're finding a benefit from like the fuel credit card on getting a discount on your gas, then that works fine. As long as you're still taking the time to figure out what's personal and what's business. But what I actually recommend to my clients is if you have, you might have multiple credit cards. Most of us do. Um, take one of your credit cards, even if it's a personal credit card, it's okay to do, but always use that for your expenses if you're putting your business expenses on a um a credit card so use that one credit card always for business and then if you have another credit card that you can use for personal and then it makes it easier um when you go to buy things and also makes it easier when you're going to pay for them knowing which account to pay out of which to pay out of. right and it makes it easier for your bookkeeper yeah because I have, um, I have personal credit cards. I mean, I have one business credit card, but I also have personal credit cards that are just for business. And right. so my bookkeeper can, has login information to see the transactions. She doesn't have a credit card. She can't spend the money, but she right. has login information. So every day she can go in there once a week, whatever it is, she can go in and see and know that those are all business. Now she yeah. might be occasionally I will pay for something with the wrong credit card. <laughs> it happens. And so she's like, what, who is this person? Or what did you buy there? I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's personal. Like don't pay for it as a business, but she catches that stuff. And then she just emails me. So if you have a bookkeeper and they're not local, I mean, I, I, I don't know how you operate, Michelle, but good heavens, don't bring me receipts. Like, <laughs> just, just put it on a credit card because then it doesn't matter. If I'm in Montana or Alabama, I can still have you doing my books for me because you're just logging into my account and you're getting that information. So put it on the credit card. Don't, you know, if you, if you don't have to write a check for it, great. Don't write a check for it. But even if you do, my bookkeeper still has access to my checking account, so yeah. she can see that. Or she has access to my checking account, so she can do bill pay. So I email her all of my bills, and then she pays my bills. And so do you have clients that do that as well? They email yeah. you their bills, or they scan their bills into you, or they mail you the bills, whatever. You know, once a week, you throw all your bills in the mail, and you mail them to Michelle. And she can then go into your account and she can be paying from there. Yeah. Yep. That is one of the services I offer is accounts payable. And yep. um, I use a, a accounts payable application that if you're using QuickBooks online, it syncs with QuickBooks online really well. But I can also do it, like you said, through your bank or, you know, whatever works best for you, whatever you're most comfortable with. Okay. I had another question while we're on this subject. Mm -hmm. um, Gwen wants to know, what about checking accounts? Should you have a personal one and a business one? That's a great question. Yes, you should. Uh, in my humble opinion, um, I think even if you're just are running, uh, you know, like a little side hustle, like they call it, I think that any business that you're mm -hmm. going to file a Schedule C or a Schedule F on your tax return, you need to have a separate checking account. 
Mm -hmm. Um, It doesn't matter if you have a thousand dollars a year being deposited into it or, you know, a million dollars a year. You need to keep that separate from your personal expenses and your personal income. It's just so much easier at tax time. Yep. Learned that the hard way when I had my first little side business in my 20s. I did all personal. It was a nightmare. My first yeah. tax return. I didn't know I was going to need all those things separate. So I would have to agree with you. And and then if you have personal and business, make sure that any money going back and forth to any account is accounted for. Right. So let your bookkeeper know I transferred money from personal to business. Now that's a loan. Yeah. Right? Because now how do you, how do you classify that? Um, you know, it, I do usually like to classify it as a loan because I think your business should be paying you back. You know, you worked hard to earn that money and to pay yourself that money. Your business shouldn't be, you know, just taking all of, all of your personal income. So I, I do usually like to classify it as a loan, but you can also make it just owner's equity. So you have more equity in the business that you've given the business. So you can do it either way. Mm-hmm. And at what at what point do we quit putting equity in our business? And who's floating who? So that, right? That's a big thing. What about a farmer that's got a seed business and they're farming? And the seed business is is um, supporting the farm. How do right. we know, how do we know what to do? And so what at where? Let's just use that as an example. I have a seed business and it. I have my books done. I have an account for my seed business. I have an account for my farm. What what do I look at to see who which business is doing what? Is it my balance sheet? Is it my profit and loss? Yeah, they, probably <laughs> both because you're going to be able to see on your profit and loss just basically that one's making money and the other one's not. Um, but not only that, you're going to be able to see also, you know, the balance of that equity account that you've been funneling into that other business. And um, you're going to be able to see that it's a lot of money that you've invested into this business and it's not making you any money, in any return on your investment. So can you t- share with us a little bit about the consulting portion of what you do? <laughs> that, I mean, I, bookkeeping is exciting, but I'm super excited about the consulting part because I have so many farmers that don't know how to fill out a loan form. They don't know how what the accountant's talking about. They don't know how to read a PL or a balance sheet. They yeah. they and so you do consulting to help. So yeah. Here's some um, stories. They're just whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. So what I, uh, my consulting starts, you know, it can start simple. Um, what I usually do with my monthly bookkeeping is I provide an analysis on your profit and loss and your balance sheet and any other um, financial statements you'd want me to run. So I can just help you if you're not great at reading those. Um, I can just help you spot trends, spot overspending, spot maybe um, places where I see that there's, um, you could be making a little more income, you know, um, opportunities like that. Um, and then the other thing that I do is I, um, you know, I have access to a lot of tools as far as benchmarking your business. Um, so I like to use those as well, just to see, um, if your spending is, um, sorry, if your spending is, you know, in line with your, um, competitors or I should say other people in the industry. And, and having an average to compare to should be saying, well, I want to do better than average. You know, I want to have a better than average profit margin. I want to have a better than average, um, you know, income and revenue. And so, um, that's a lot of it is just figuring out, helping you to decide what business changes you can make to be more profitable. Um, because a lot, you know, I find out that the majority of farmers and ranchers, their family businesses, they want to have this business around for the next generation and the generation after that. But if you're not being profitable, if you're not taking the time to look at your numbers, I don't think, I think that you have a lot better chance of, you know, going bankrupt, losing the farm. And how can you market? You know, I... I talk a lot about crop side marketing. You guys hear me talk about it all the time because I just love those guys. But they have the system. And so you need to know your numbers to put in there so you know when to sell and 
when you're making money and when you're not. And if you don't have the numbers, if, if you don't have somebody like Michelle doing those numbers for you, mm-hmm. how do you, how do you know that? You know, that it is, you need to know your numbers for more than one thing. So how do you share or how do you um, consult as far as like, or do you do any consulting as far as bank loans, um, yeah. helping with paperwork there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can help them get the right um, financial reports that they need um, for their you know, for their bank, I know exactly what their loan application should look like. And so, yeah, I can certainly help with that, um, help them determine, um, you know, it's just little things like, you know, you, they always want to see your profit and loss. They always want to see your previous year's tax returns, but also your current um, balance sheet and sometimes or your current balance sheet and profit and loss. And sometimes they even want to see a projected. And, you know, most farmers and ranchers, they don't even know how to project. Um so that's something that I can help them with too, is a projected income and expense. Awesome. Okay. And so how does that, last time we talked, you mentioned something about amortization with the bank is not the same as amortization on your taxes. Can you expand yeah. that a little? Yeah. So um, if you um, buy an asset, say you buy a new tractor. Um, your accountant is going to help you decide what's the best way to depreciate that tractor to avoid tax liability. That's their job. They want to help you to avoid tax liability. But, you know, so they might go ahead and depreciate 100% of that in one year. Um, just depending on, you know, how, how much income you made. You might have bought that tractor because you had a really great, um, crop season. And so you're replacing a tractor. And um, so you're going to offset a little bit of income with that. But then again, your banker is going to want to see on your balance sheet what the true value of that um, tractor is. You know, they don't care if you depreciated all of it in one year. It still has value to them. On your balance sheet, they still want to see what the current value is. So, so I have a couple of things. So, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Are you running different balance sheets then? This is the balance uh, yeah. This is a balance sheet for the accountant. This is a balance sheet. So are you also then, I, as I was listening, I just thought of a question. Are you willing to or do you ever sit in with the accountant um, when it's yeah. time to do our taxes? The accountant's going to need to talk to you, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I like to have a really strong relationship with your CPA, whoever it is, because um, we all three of us need to be on the same page. Um, and you know, I just, I, I think that it's just, um, a, a good way to do business is to get to know your accountant and, um, you know, cause I like to ask them, how do you like your, um, chart of account set up? You know, is there anything special about this client that I need to know that you, you know, that you're going to want to do at the end of the year? Because you'll find that accountants a lot of time they'll have to go in and do cleanup and they just want to make a bunch of journal entries. And that's a lot of time they're spending, spending going in there and making all those journal entries to fix things. And Mm -hmm. when it could have just been done properly the entire year. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I, I asked them, what are you fixing? What are you changing? Uh, you know, what can I do to, to make this, these books as clean for you as possible so that your, you know, tax preparation is as seamless as it can be. And that is so super important. Um, mm-hmm. I know the gal that does my bookkeeping, uh, my accountant out of Vegas has said, I have probably the cleanest books he's ever seen. And they were just, they were so ecstatic to get books, to get, to get what they needed. And it was categorized right. And everything was right. And they didn't have to do a lot of stuff. And so that then leads me to the question of not every bookkeeper is worth their money because it's the account and and I am speaking not because I'm here to tell Michelle, but I am speaking because of the fact that I worked in an accounting firm at one point in my life and they did bookkeeping. And I am telling you that I got, you know, obviously I have friends in that industry and those people will tell you that, the accountants will say, I got these books in and they were so bad. I mean, so you put, so you did it yourself. And I'm not saying that you can't do it yourself, but 
but you know, we tend to want to do it ourselves. So we've got this QuickBooks at home and we're putting it all in ourselves and our accountant gets it and he just wants to pull his hair out anyway because yeah. it's not right. And so you spent all this time doing it and he spent all this time fixing it. So if we don't have a bookkeeper that understands what the tax return means mm-hmm. and how that tax return is filed, are you paying a bookkeeper or are you doing it just to create busyness because the accountant's going to do it different anyway? So yeah. how do we know if we're doing it right or if we need to find a new bookkeeper? Um, well, uh, I think to answer the first question, to know if you're doing right, you can ask your CPA, um, you know, to be brutally honest with you. And because, uh, you know, they're in the business of keeping their clients happy, so they might not be completely honest with you unless you ask. So if you say, I really want to improve this, what can I do? They're going to tell you. They're going to know exactly what you're doing wrong. Um, if, they know how of, to, if, they know how to use, if they know how to use QuickBooks. Yes. I know some CPAs that do not know shit about QuickBooks. Mm-hmm. And so they're going to be of no help to you yeah. because you don't know it either. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's, you know, if you're using, like, QuickBooks, you can go online and say, I want to find a pro advisor. There's a website. And you can find one either in your area who are, who's certified in QuickBooks. And that's going to be a good indication of knowing whether or not they're going to be able to help you um, and, and give you the information that you need. And same with a bookkeeper. Um, like, I'm a certified pro advisor through QuickBooks. And so you have to go through and take some tests and um, they test your knowledge to ensure that you know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, shoot, I had, another que- I had another question for you and I lost it. Oh, well, uh, and I know we were kind of talking about is uh, how do I know if a bookkeeper is, you know, if they're doing it right, if they're experienced. And so I think there's a couple of different factors. And one truly is just experience. Um you know, we're all human. We all make mistakes. We all learn from our mistakes. So someone who's been doing it 10, 15, 20 years, they're just going to have more experience than someone who's fresh. I'm not saying that someone who's fresh is not going to be able to do a good job. It's just, um, you know, you learn from experience. Um, yeah. And the other thing is um, education. That does usually help. You know, um, a lot of bookkeepers have gone to school for their accounting degree. And so they you know, sat in a college for four years to learn how to do these things. Mm -hmm. Um, But something that I found to be the most um, predictive of how good your bookkeeper is going to be and how successful they're going to be is just um, asking them for um, reviews and recommendations from their previous clients. Mm -hmm. So if they're um, keeping their previous clients happy, and and they're satisfied with the work that they're getting, You that's usually a pretty good indicator of whether or not they are going to provide you with a good service. Or ask the accountants, right? Yeah, who, yeah exactly. Who, you work with, who are the CPAs that you work with? And call those CPAs to see if they're mm-hmm. getting what they need, if that bookkeeper is asking, is meeting with them. Um, but I think that, I think that you just, it's so... I didn't realize how important it was to have a bookkeeper that knew what they were doing until until I worked at the accounting firm. And the accounting firm would go out and sit with businesses that hired bookkeepers. And they would, someone in our staff at the time would hours, spent hours and hours and hours cleaning up messes because the person they hired didn't know how to categorize things for taxes. And I just think that that is so important. Um, And again, you know, it is if you just have to understand that. So the one of the biggest issues, Michelle, is how do I afford a bookkeeper? Because I already can't pay my bills. Yeah. Um, You know, I think that it's all in if you see the value of it. If you see the value of having, you know, your business information every month, and, you know, not only that, but not having to be stressed at tax time and spending weeks upon weeks trying to get your books in order. Um, so it's going to relieve you stress. It's going to add value to your business. And I think that when you are looking at these numbers and you're being able to make management decisions, you're going to start seeing an increase in your income and an increase in your revenue. Um, I just 
it's a natural um, chain of events. Um, mm-hmm. But the other thing is, um, what I usually recommend to my prospective clients who are afraid that they can't afford a bookkeeper, um, first thing, it's usually more affordable than you think. Um, it's it's certainly a lot less expensive than like your CPA, and right. they're probably doing a lot of your bookkeeping at the end of the year anyway. Um, but the other thing is, there's usually places that we can find where you can um, cut back on some expenses. And we can say, okay, so I know that if you cut back on these expenses, that will more than pay my monthly fee. Mm-hmm. And so there's, you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at it for sure. Mm-hmm. And I got a question. Um, I got a question from uh, somebody as well that said, when do I know if it's feasible to hire a bookkeeper? But he went on to say that the live that I did yesterday or the day before, whenever I did it, um, letting you guys all know Michelle was going to be here, I touched on, somebody said that bookkeeping makes them anxious. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said that very same thing. He said, I just have anxiety around my numbers. I have anxiety around not knowing them. And then I'm supposed to go market my grain and I'm supposed to go to the bank and I feel foolish not knowing those numbers. And I know he is not alone because I have a lot of people that I have talked to that said the exact same thing. They feel horrible when they go to the bank and they don't know. They don't, because a lot of times the banker will hand over, from what I understand, the banker will just hand over a sheet and say, here you go, fill this out for your loan information. Mm -hmm. And they know that information and so they it just doesn't make you feel good and yeah you know can should you be buying into a bookkeeping service because it makes you feel good well if you shouldn't like be I mean it's not like you're buying it to cover up a feeling you're buying it so that you know those numbers and you look like you know what you're doing and when you can fill those numbers out the bank is going to have a lot more faith in you because they're going to feel good as well. Giving you those numbers, knowing that you have somebody helping you or you're doing that yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes it just comes down to like confidence or doing the things in your business that really excite you. Um, that usually helps you to thrive in your business. So if bookkeeping isn't something that excites you and you're spending wasting, I should say, your precious time doing that, and it's not what, you know, lights your fire, I think that your time could be better spent. Sometimes it's just as simple as that. Or if you're, it's causing marriage issues, Mm -hmm. let's be real. If you're going to be fighting about money because she wants the books done and you don't want the books done or vice versa, like if it is causing massive issues, Get somebody else to do it. I am sorry, but yeah. Michelle's going to be cheaper in a divorce all day long. <laughs> okay, I say that all the time when I hire somebody to do something at my house. I'm like, you know what? That drywall guy is cheaper than a divorce because if it's not done perfectly, I'm not going to be happy with it. Right. I, you know, or, okay, right? Let's just, let's just use a situation where the wife might be doing the books. And the husband is like, well, why aren't we need to sell grain? And she says, no, you can't sell grain because you're not going to make a profit. Or the wife is doing the books and saying, hey, why are you going to buy that tractor? Because we don't have a need for it. So for to move that to a third party and even have, okay, fine, if your wife is going to do the books, but maybe move this consulting to Michelle and you sit down and have a third party say, no, you can't buy the damn combine. Or you can't right. buy the tractor. Because she's right. There's nothing here. I'm not taking her side. These are the numbers. And moving that out of your household and moving it to somebody else that is objective to look at it and not say, you know what, maybe you can buy it, but let's do this, this, and this. So you can buy it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's helpful also with, you know, multi-generation farms too. Mm. I've come to find out because, uh, you know, the generations aren't always on the same page. Right. Oh, that's good. I would have not thought of that. Yeah. Have the whole, if we're a corporation, have everybody yeah. at the table and everybody needs to talk about that. And Jolene Brown just talked about that when I went to her conference in Dickinson um, uh, two weeks ago. 
And she said, every year there needs to be a family meeting and everybody needs to be in that meeting. So great. We have a family meeting. You know, Michelle comes in, does the book part of it, and, you know, she's done. But if we want to buy something, maybe we look at, if we can't get along and we can't all agree at the same time, maybe we need to have somebody like Michelle come in and say, is this going to be a good purchase? Is Mm -hmm. it not a good purchase? It's no different than having me come in and say, okay, where do we need life insurance in this situation? Because we have a corporation. What do we do? What are the strategies? You and I work with those strategies all day long with all different farmers. We Mm -hmm. see many things instead of just being stuck with our blinders on a little bit, not because we want them on, but because this is our business. This is the way we've done it. And it's just, it's hard to look at and think outside of the box. Yeah. Yep. I agree with that. Okay. Um, let's see. Should you keep track of expenses on each piece of equipment in the accounting program or in another way? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if it's so important that it's um, equipment based. I guess if you're worried that maybe you're spending too much money on one piece of equipment or it's, you know, something like that, I guess that would be okay. But um, something that you can utilize, like especially in QuickBooks, is classes. So if you want to know, you know, if you are one business entity and you have different um, businesses within that, that you're, you know, maybe you are custom farming and you're um, ranching and you want to figure out what the separate, you know, income and expense are for each of these different, um, you know, operations, then you can use your classes for that. And I think that it is, you know, a helpful um way of thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, what is the difference between QuickBooks or other accounting software? What's the best? What's the best? Is there a best or is it just do something? Yeah, you know, um, in my opinion, I think that QuickBooks is the best. Um, <laughs> I'm not paid to say that. You know, just for me personally, I find it to be the most user-friendly. I'm working to get in all of my clients on QuickBooks Online. It's cloud-based, so they can access their books from anywhere. I can access their books from anywhere. They don't need to send me a file like you're having to do with desktop. Um, yeah, but Quicken is, you know, Quicken's not another um, common one. And um, it's if it's what you like to use, that's okay, too. It's just a little more difficult for your accountant because um, you can't send the file as easily. And then also it doesn't accept journal entries. Mm-hmm. So, um, there's a lot of applications that I use that use journal entries to sync information to them. Um, whether it be my bill paying software that I use or even just my payroll software. Otherwise, I would be sitting there having to manually entry, enter each of these transactions. And that's just, in my opinion, you know, I don't want to be manually <laughs> entering things. It's just it takes a lot of my time and I could be spending that time, you know, doing analysis for you or something else. Or it costs them more money because you're manually entering stuff. I mean, I pay so little to have my books done, in my opinion. I Mm -hmm. pay so little because everything just gets downloaded in there. And it takes her no time at all. Um, And and because she's good at it, you know. So for you, it's going to take me a lot longer to do what you do, even if it's downloaded. But it's... The downloading portion helps. Now, what about, I have looked before, what about, um, there are special softwares for farmers. Have you looked at yeah. any of these? Yeah, um, I've actually looked into a couple different ones. Um, there's Easy Farm that I think is actually based out of North Dakota. And I oh. have used them for things. Um, but I've come to find out that they aren't as specialized as they think they are. And it's, a, you know, they don't have, like, the, the really nice um, things about them that, like, QuickBooks Online does because you can't do a bank feed sync, you know, so it's not going to automatically upload your bank feeds for you. So you're sitting there, and it's more manual entry. Um, and then I've also, um, there are some that are ma- some that are made specifically for, like, managing your crops or managing your cattle inventory. 
And probably just like the crop manager part or the cattle manager part, they're probably, if that's what you think that you need for your business, then I would say go ahead and use it. But they are going to be expensive and they are going to be completely manual entry. Um, so, but yeah, I, you know, I don't think that there's many, um, farm, ranch, or agribusinesses that can't just utilize QuickBooks and all of the, the, um, you know, applications and everything that we can use with that. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I like that. Okay. I, um, we don't have any more questions on there. Uh, you had some, you had some questions that you sent me. How do I pay myself? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, if you're a business owner and you're working in the business, you should be getting a paycheck. <laughs> um, I know that farmers are, you know, go ahead. Sorry, sorry I'm going to jump in, Michelle. You yeah. should be getting a paycheck because you are not operating as a sole proprietor, right? You should be getting a paycheck because you're a corporation or you're an S corp or you're an LLP or you're an LLC with an S corp designation. Are you, but let's say that we're not a corporation. Are um, you, if you're, Oh, go ahead. People are, I'm sorry. Are you paying people as sole proprietors? I, yep, yeah, I will do that. Okay. Because I find that prioritizing paying yourself prioritizes making a profit in the business. Mm-hmm. So if you're saying I need to pay myself for all of the blood, sweat and tears that I'm putting into this business, even if it's just a sole proprietorship, then you know, you're going to prioritize making that happen and you're going to make sure that there's money there, that there's profit available to pay yourself. Um, and you can still take a profit distribution at the end of the year. And I recommend a, a quarterly profit distribution if they're using, if they're running themselves a payroll. So you're getting paid as an employee and you're getting paid as an owner. Mm-hmm. And if you do that, you should not be borrowing living expenses. No. Yeah. Right? Um, your your pay from your business should be paying your your living expenses. Right. Yeah. Yep. And I had a lady tell me one time she said until we were set up as a corporation and we started getting payroll, that was the first time ever I was able to have money to do stuff to the house, to buy to buy groceries without having to access our operating note to do that. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. it's just that's a big deal. Just what you said is you know if you're making a profit. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise it's just coming out of operating and you lock it into operating. So yeah. if you're not making a profit and you can't pay yourself, then we need to look at our marketing. And what are we doing for marketing? And what are those numbers? What needs to change? Holy shit, we can't pay ourselves. We better sit down with Michelle and have a consult and figure out what's going on with our numbers, right? I mean, yeah. that's it. That's a big deal. What you just said, there's a big deal to me, obviously. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but what are, let's take a look at what is really going on. Um, mm-hmm. and, and when you can objectively look at that and suppress the fear a little bit, because you know somebody like Michelle's there to help you figure out how we can make this profitable. My mm-hmm. gosh, you have somebody on your team to help. It's not just you. Because I know just the anxiety, if my bank account gets low, the anxiety that I have around that or the anxiety that I had before I had money to pay all my bills, I get it. So if we don't have that, it's hard to be objective when we look at our numbers, when we're anxious and we're very emotional. But if we can bring somebody else in to say, hey, it's okay, we can do this, this, and this, and it's going to give us a way out. It's no different than my clients that come in and go, Mary Jo, I finally slept last night. After we met, I that was the first time we've slept in years because you gave us a way out of the debt and we could see that. And so it's the same thing looking at your numbers. If you're not paying yourself, you're not making a profit. We're like, we're going to put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So sole proprietor, LLC, corporation, S Corp, yeah. whatever it is. If and if you find that moving to a corporation is what you need to do, if you think that's a step you need to take to feel like you should pay yourself, then do it. You know, mm-hmm. um, I feel like a sole proprietor should be a temporary situation. That should be a stepping stone to 
to becoming an LLC, to becoming a corporation. Um, you know, it doesn't have quite the same, um, you know, safety net as, as a corporation would be. So. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I preach that all the time. You need to be a corporation. And when you, and, and the equipment should be a different corporation than the farm or the land because you cannot, you, it is all lawsuit driven. And that equipment, if it's not in the LLC right now, it has to get moved to the LLC and there's some paperwork that has to be done there and there's some number shifting that has to be done there. And so I think along with um, the bookkeeping, the accountant also really needs to be pulled into that change to see how we're going to shift the ownership of those things. Because yeah. it's just as easy as saying, oh, now I'm going to title the tractor to the new corporation. Mm-hmm. It's not that easy. Um, yeah. Do I need to keep receipts? Yes. Okay. Um, do I need to send receipts to you? Do I need to send my receipts to you? Um, so what I like to do is, um, I, for the most part, I can use my best judgment, um, when I'm looking at your books and figure out where things are spent, but I'm never going to make an assumption about something either. So, um, I might run your reports and say, I have questions on these, you know, 20 transactions. Tell me what was going on there. And so I will certainly get your input if it's something I'm not sure about. But just lately, I've actually started using um, just this. It's an application that goes on your phone. You actually just take a picture of your receipt and it will sync with your QuickBooks Online account. And so, um, you know, you can take that receipt and then I can it will come up to me on the QuickBooks Online and I will say, OK, I know exactly what this is for because I have the receipt in front of my face. And that's also nice for for like audit protection, too, because it's right there with the transaction. If, if you ever get audited. You know, you still need to keep your receipts, you know, in a box and store them for seven years. But it, it is nice to have it all in one place, too. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's awesome. I did not know about that. <laughs> I'm going to have to download said app. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, it's called no, HubDoc, if you're wondering about it. Keeping all these receipts. Like, yeah. Because you know, if, it, if it uploads it there, then I don't have to save it. Is that what you said? I would still save it, but you can just throw them in the back room. I mean, they don't have to be easily accessible. They can just, you know, I mean, you can just throw them in a box if you want to. They don't even really need to be organized because there's a good chance you're never going to need to look at them. So. Right. Okay. Um, can I deduct expenses I purchased with cash? Yes. Um, and if you do, you better have the receipt. <laughs> so yeah. what I what I like to do is any cash withdrawal goes into a petty cash account, and then when um a cash expense is is goes to is used from cash, then I will go ahead and code that into QuickBooks from the petty cash account. Okay, so petty cash means I have I maybe withdrew a hundred dollars, so that's mm-hmm. petty. So I buy something with 50. Now that means I have 50. I, I spent that first 50. Now I only have 50 left. Yeah. And usually the balance of that petty cash account at the end of the year, I go to owner pay or owner distribution, because if you can't prove that it was a business expense, we want to clean up that petty cash account. And we're just going to say that you, you know, you used it for personal expenses. Okay. And that's the other reason why it's important to <laughs> keep the receipt because, you know, with cash, you really, truly do need the receipt um, mm-hmm. because otherwise you have no idea what it was for or how much it was for. So. Mm-hmm. And it's, that's why it's really nice to just not use cash. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I, I just don't. I mean, I if I'm in an airport and I have a $3 water, you know, I mean, I, I just I put it on the credit card because mm-hmm. I don't. I am not organized enough to scan, to save that receipt, send it to my bookkeeper. Like, oh my gosh, it takes me more than $3 just to think about it, you know? Yeah. And I think that even the most organized person loses receipts occasionally. Mm -hmm. So if you lose one out of every hundred receipts and it was a cash receipt, that's, you know, that's not a good thing. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't really recommend using cash. Yeah. Cause it's, it's a matter of, this is what I always say is you went and you bought that part with cash and then you got in the pickup and you threw the receipt on the seat and all your windows are open and there goes your receipt, you know? And so 
it's not, yeah, it's just not ideal. Granted, they can probably go back and reprint that for you, but now you have to go there and have them reprint it. Yeah. Um, we talked about this a little bit, but did you have anything to add about why can't my wife do the books? <laughs> Um, yeah. So, um, you know, it's like I talked about before. If your wife is like a math genius and she is great at bookkeeping and it's what she enjoys doing, that's great. If you, the farmer, the husband are the <laughs> one that's really detail oriented and, you know, you feel like you would be doing a better job, I don't think you're going to hurt your wife's feelings. She probably isn't enjoying it that much anyway. So I just feel like it's really just about matching skills and expertise and interests, you know, sometimes just being interested in it is enough. But mm -hmm. if either of you is at that place where you feel like you're doing a good job or you really enjoy it, if you completely dread it so much that you're putting it off and you're not doing it on a regular basis, then you're doing yourself and your business, uh, you know, a disfavor because you're making your situation worse through your anxiety <laughs> and through your avoidance. So if that's okay. the case, then find a professional. Yeah, I have, um, I've gone through Strategic Coach and Dan Sullivan has wrote a book about procrastination and it is not that procrastination is negative. It is that if you procrastinate on something, it's because you don't like doing it. So find somebody that loves doing that and get them to do it because they're going to do a better job and it's going to free your time up to do things that you love to do that you're good at that are going to most likely make you money. And so... I get, I mean, I get, I still have to do things that I don't like, you know, but as we get there, this is that big thing. If you're procrastinating about it, it is because you don't like to do it or you're not good at it or there's anxiety around it. Find somebody else that is. I mean, I just can't, I can't imagine how much money it's going to save you to have this ready for your accountant. Instead of going into your accountant at the end of the year and he's scrambling to get everything done, how accurate can he or she be on the accounting side to get everything done for you? And then you're trying to decide, should I be buying something? Should I not be buying something? We all know my feelings about that. Yeah. However, you're still doing it. So if that is the case, why you could just have a report run in two seconds and you would know if I should be buying something or not. Should I sell more grain or should I not sell more grain? Did I sell too much grain and I ended up paying more taxes? Should I carry it over to next year? Um, mm -hmm. If we can show the accountant that information, if we can show the baker that information, if we know what we should be selling for, like to me, it is just a no-brainer. You just hire a bookkeeper. Um, and I know that you have different areas of how you charge based on based on um, who's working with you. So mm -hmm. if you guys want to talk to Michelle and you want to get an idea of how you can work with her, I'm going to put, I, I shared it yesterday as well, but I'm going to share it in the comments here, Her the link to her Facebook page. Um, and then Michelle, you have a website as well, correct? Yep. Yeah. It's just patentbookkeeping.com. Okay. And that's um, P-A-T-T-E-N. Yep, double T's, double K's, double E's. Yeah, it's a lot of letters. <laughs> Patentbookkeeping.com. Um, oh, dang it, I had another question. Oh, what will you do? And I know we haven't talked about this, so I hate to put you on the spot. But if you don't know, you say you don't know. If What if somebody is doing bookkeeping already and they just want to consult with you and say, hey, can you look at our files? Can you just see if I'm coding things correctly? Will you do that for people as well? Yeah. Yep. Um, I, if you just give me access to your file, I will do give you like an audit and okay. I just will do that, you know, probably on an hourly basis, um, however mm -hmm. long it takes me and then give you, um, an audit of what's being done wrong and then what actions you can take to improve in the future. And also, you know, an estimate of what it might take to be, um, cleaned up as well if they're looking for that. So. Oh, awesome. Okay. I think then. People would be crazy if they didn't take advantage of that just because you think that you're doing it right. But if you're not, it's hurting you on the loan side with the banker. It's hurting you on the accounting side because it's going to cost you money on the accounting side. Um, that is a big deal. Um, 
Do you have anything else that we didn't talk about that maybe you think is important for people to know? Um, let me just look through my notes here. But, no, I think the biggest thing for me is just, you know, every, every year that you wait till tax season to do your books, you're missing 12 months of information to know how you should be making management decisions. Um, I just don't know how you can be making management decisions if you're not doing your bookkeeping on a monthly basis, you know? Um, so I guess that's just my biggest point is, is you should be doing your bookkeeping regularly and it's, and it's for the reason that you need to be able to access that information to make the important decisions in your business. And management decisions, meaning, can I hire somebody? Do I need to hire somebody? Are they costing me money? Um, can we afford health care? Can we afford life insurance? Can we afford to go on vacation? Um, what, like, those are, ma can we afford to take a week off? Um, can we afford to pay ourselves for holidays? You know, those are management decisions. And those are just, it, it's, they're not small decisions by any means, but it's that it goes beyond just can I buy a tractor or combine or more cows or a squeeze shoes or a new pickup. It goes far beyond that. Because let me tell you, like if you can take a couple of days off and hire somebody to feed cows, then do it. Because guess what? You need it and so does your spouse. Yeah. I mean it is it is and so do your kids probably. You know, I mean when I went to school, I was like the only kid that never got to go on vacation it's mm -hmm. because you had cows to feed and nobody could feed them. And it was, it you know, it wasn't awful. I mean, obviously we live and it wasn't a big deal. But as an adult now, I'm like, there is, we are not missing a vacation. Like I am taking some time off. I'm going to see some things because as a kid, we didn't get that. So, um, and I have one last question too. Matt asked, I have two bankers and an accountant for, I have asked two bankers and an accountant for recommendations for a bookkeeper and they didn't know who to recommend. Is that a red flag or common occurrence? Um, you know, it might just mean that there's a lack of bookkeepers in your area or they haven't taken the time to, um, you know, acquaint themselves with the bookkeepers in the area. So it might, it might go, might be either option. And, you know, um, a CPA, um, if it's a CPA who does a lot of bookkeeping at the end of the year, they might decide that it's, they want to make that extra billing hours. I mean, I don't know. It, you know, there's a lot of layers to it. But, yeah, I would say more than likely it's just a lack of bookkeepers in the area. And you might have to go outside of your, you know, small town to find someone. Um, and that's perfectly normal. Or it's a lack of good bookkeepers. Yeah. Yep. And so yeah, they just, if they're not recommending anyone and you know three bookkeepers are in your same town, like you said, it might be they aren't quality. Yeah. I mean, you guys, how long did it take me to find Michelle? I have been looking for farm bookkeepers to bring to the table for a long time. Like we're talking years and I couldn't find them. And so I have found Michelle and there's another gal that um, I have been in contact with now as well but it's not easy to find and no. the book typically your cpa wants that done in-house because they can charge 90 dollars or more per hour to do it and it's yeah. a great extra income for them mm -hmm. you know it doesn't mean that people can't do it michelle is a stay-at-home mom and you know she's got other you have other stay-at-home moms employed for you right yeah. So it is, it's even my bookkeeper. She was a CPA and is now a stay at home mom. And so they do it to fit in. It doesn't, it's the fit in their time. Um, because it's just that, you know, you want to be able to do that. So it's, it, there's, there's a lack. They're hard to find. Um, and as a CPA, why wouldn't I just want you to give me $90 an hour? And that's yeah. what I think has driven the whole, I can't, I can't have my books done. I can't afford to have my books done because my CPA charges $90 an hour. 
Well, let yeah. me tell you, I do not pay $90 an hour um, mm-hmm. to have it done. I mean, if I had to, I would, but I looked and I asked and even to find the gal that I found, I looked for a long time and asked for a long time who mm-hmm. people would use. And I was just really lucky that she quit. She quit working at the accounting firm and went home to be a CPA. So, okay. and, but I can't even refer people to her because she's so busy that she doesn't have time to do it. And and I think that you're good. Bookkeepers are busy. They're going to be busy because the account accountants are recommending them. Here's another thing that I've ran into, um, Matt, is that oh, $100. Matt's running into $120 an hour. Yeah. Um, another thing that I've run into is that accountants don't take the time to learn and they don't take the time to learn about life insurance. And I'm not going to dig on accountants here, but Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that we get, sometimes we get to a point and it's not all accountants because I've talked to some accountants that actually look at it, but accountants are busy and we get to a point where we've kind of got a little bit of the, the arrival syndrome and we think we know everything and Maybe we're 50 years old or 60 years old and we're five years away from retirement. So why would we look now? You know, and it's, it's more about them spending time than them helping their clients. And so it's one thing that I always try to do is if somebody brings something new to me, I want to look to, I want to look into it so I can give them an educated opinion about it. And I think that just sometimes professionals go, Oh, I don't have time to do it. No, I, I don't know anybody. They're not looking to create that circle of trusted professionals, which is exactly why I have Michelle, why I have the attorneys I work with, because those are people I trust that I can refer my clients to, or I can refer other farmers to, even if they're not clients. Because we need to have those contacts, and we need to have those people that we can trust. And not every business owner does that. Not every professional does that. So there even might be somebody locally, but they just don't even know about it because they don't care to know. They're not looking for it. They don't feel that they need to provide that service. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, if I do not have a CPA that I could recommend at this point because I've not found one that I love. And so, um, especially for farmers on the farm side, but I'm always looking. So Matt, if you're asking your CPA and they don't know, it's to me that speaks more volumes for why doesn't why aren't they looking for somebody to refer their clients to? Because is it because I can charge more per hour and I will clean up their mess at the end of the year more per hour? Or is it because I just don't care? I think a lot of it comes down to that. So I'm, I'm going to be a little bit harsh on them today because I see it in the industry. I see it with attorneys. Mm-hmm. Attorneys are the same way. They do not look for somebody in the life insurance side to say, hey, I can refer you there. You know, they don't look at that person maybe as a professional, which is not okay. It's not okay because we are all, we all have a God-given talent and we are all very good at a certain thing. And Michelle is very good at bookkeeping and I'm very good at life insurance and they're very good at tax returns. And so we can't do everything because if we do, it's going to be half-assed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm just going to be frank. Because <laughs> nobody would expect any less from me (laughs) okay um i don't have any other questions we do not have any other questions there um we did i i see one of my um awesome my marketing lady put the michelle's a link to michelle's facebook page on there and or her inner or her oh it's her website so yay so annie posted that on there So awesome, awesome, awesome. If you guys need information, go there. Um, You know, I just have total faith that Michelle is going to help you as best as she possibly can. And if she can't, she's going to say she can't. So you're not going to get. um, I offer free consultations to everyone. Um, So, you know, if we're going to sit down and talk about things, you're not going to be charged right off the bat, you know, and we'll have, we'll take the time to decide if we're a good fit for each other. Um, so I found that's very important. So what does that consultation look like? Um, 
Well, it kind of depends, but like a lot of times I will just do like a Zoom meeting or something along the lines of that. And um, I like for them to give me access to their QuickBooks if they're using QuickBooks so that I can look through and do kind of a quick audit. And then we'll discuss, you know, what their needs are, what their wants are. And um, after that, I'll come back with them and um, come up with a few different service options for them. You know, what's the most I can do? What's the least I can do? And somewhere in the middle, I usually offer three different packages that's specifically made just for this client. Um, and then, then we go from there and, um, you know, it, it, at no point are they ever obligated until we sign an engagement letter. So, okay. And you guys, Michelle, like you, if you can't tell how sweet Michelle is, she's definitely not like me. Like she's not all outspoken and verbal like me. She's very, <laughs> so I cannot imagine. And I do not like people that sell me something. I don't like people that harass me. And so, if I say, okay, I'm going to have this consult with you, are you going to harass me to do business with you afterwards? No. Okay. You know, here's the way I look at it. If you don't think I'm a good fit for you, then I don't want to work with you. Um, you know, we have to have a mutual understanding, a mutual trust and um, a professional relationship. So if you don't, if you don't think it's a good fit, I'm totally okay with that. And then I'm ready to move on. And if you're not ready, Michelle's not going to make you ready because then nobody's going to be happy. It's the exact thing that I do. I'm not going to pester you. I'm not going to, you know, I might follow up to see if you have another question, but you're not going to get pestered. Um, Michelle, is there information on your website for tips, blogs, that kind of thing that people should be constantly looking for? Yeah, I do have a blog. And um, pretty soon here, I'm going to start, um, you know, with a, a email, you know, I might send out once a month email just to update them what's going on, what information I've shared, um, that type of thing. And, and eventually that'll be on my website where people can um, subscribe to that. But for now, it's mostly just at the blog and I usually share everything on Facebook as well. So, okay. So don't be scared to private message her. Don't be scared to email her. Don't be scared to call her. I mean, look at her. She's not going to bite you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, patentbookkeeping.com. Go there. Please, if you have any other questions, you can put them in the comments. Michelle's been checking those. So you can put them in the comments. You can message me if you don't want to message her. Because you're on the page, I'll make sure that she gets it, that she can reply to you. But we have had um, a great, like, we've had a lot of good questions today. So, fantastic, fantastic. So, if we have any, if we have a lot of other stuff, we'll probably have Michelle back just so that we can answer that. And, and maybe we'll have her back closer to tax time if she has time. Because remember, she's going to be busy during tax time too. Because all of you, we're going to be last minute getting your stuff to Michelle. Mm -hmm. So so if we have time, we'll have her back just to talk about maybe, you know, maybe next time we talk about more taxes. Like what do we need to do to prepare for the tax return, the yeah. bank stuff, whatever. Michelle and I will work on that. But if there's anything in specific you guys want, let us know so that we can come back and we can address that. Okay, thanks for your time, Michelle. I very much appreciate it. Um, let us know if there's anything that we can do for you. But okay. in the meantime, we'll talk to you later. All right, thanks so much, Mary Jo. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.